So over the last two years or so, I've been trying to apply Lacanian psychoanalysis or psychoanalytical theory to certain um, topics on Spanish politics. Um, being them, the trans rights law, and then also the law against sexual violence, which is called in Spanish solo CSC, only yes means yes. And I wanted to kind of uh, study what's going on in those two legislations, who are the people protected by those legislations, and who are also the people who are being excluded from those um, legislations. So I'm going to be speaking from a psychoanalytical approach, but also from an intersectional approach, and I know that some of the topics that I'll be explaining today, or like putting on the table, may be problematic. So I'm going to try to, I mean, I'm going to try my best not to get lost in this, because it's like really easy for me. And um, I also wanted you to interrupt me if there's something you don't understand, or if, or if I use any term from like a psychoanalysis that you do not control. Okay, so we are doing this. Uh, anyway. um, so the first thing that I wanted to introduce, and it's going to be like, I think I'm going to introduce like five bullets, or say six, say six bullets. The first one is the way in which I approach psychoanalysis from a feminist uh, intersectional approach. So, um, do you know the notion of the symbolic in Lacan? So we have the symbolic, which is this register that is uh, based on language, norms, etc., etc., to put it like in an easy um, way. So many of the appropriations from feminism towards uh, of the of Lacanian theory are actually articulated uh, through this notion, the notion of the, uh, of the symbolic. So um, Teresa Brennan and also Elizabeth Wright, they try to articulate the fact that the Lacanian symbolic, or the symbolic in Lacanian terms, is a patriarchal uh, symbolic. All right. So in my book, what I try to go is, okay, we can define reality as the product of certain uh, discursive operations, right? But there's always one first discursive operation. So I, I said, okay, we go to Lacan. Lacan says that the first discursive operation that takes place is the master's discourse. And I don't know if you have the master's discourse in mind. But in the master's discourse uh, structure, you have a master signifier, S1, that intervenes in a battery of signifiers, which is X2, uh, S2, right? So what I argue from a feminist approach is that the S1 that is intervening on S2 is the signifier master, right? So we can see how this embodied or we can see how that discursive operation that creates reality is being created through the idea of masculinity, right? So if we look at the master's discourse, the main uh, result of that discourse is the bad subject. So what I argue is that if the, ma the master signify that is intervening is masculine, the subject that appears is man, right? So the bad subject, let's say the subject that is included in that symbolism is man as we traditionally uh, think of the white, cisgender, heterosexual men, right? Um, <coughs> so, I am following here Teresa Brennan, I don't know if you know this uh, philosopher, she says, one can conceive of a symbolic that is not patriarchal. The real problem is that the symbolic in Latin makes it seem that patriarchy is inevitable. Inevitable? Inevitable? So, I was thinking, okay, so we have a patriarchal symbolic, but I, I, I think that this patriarchal symbolic is being used, or it's, yeah, to create this idea of man through the imposition of the uh, signifier masculine. However, I was like, oh, okay, maybe we can conceive a non-patriarchal symbolic. So I was thinking, okay, then a non-patriarchal symbolic, maybe a feminist symbolic, could be the result of the intervention of a master signifier that is feminine, right? Nevertheless, I was like, this is problematic, because what's feminine? What's, what's woman? No? 
<laughs> so that will be kind of like the first um, the first idea. Okay, we have symbolic, we know there is a Pachaka symbolic, let's try to uh, get rid of this Pachaka symbolic. And one thing or one result or one solution to this Pachaka symbolic would be okay, let's intervene the, uh, the battery of signifiers with a signifier that is feminine. However, if we look from intersectional feminism, we have some, uh, I don't know what to say, some, I don't know what to say, um, resistance, 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 yes. resistance no? to, to how do we define this? How, how do we create this new master signifier able to create, let's say, another symbol? For me, this comes to another problematic, which is the problem of hegemony. Okay? Uh, how do you pronounce it? Hegemony. So we have the problem of hegemony. So if you go to the Lacanian left and you go, for example, to I think the main uh, figures of the idea of hegemony in the Lacanian left are uh, Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau. More in Ernesto Laclau, you can see how hegemony has to do with the relation between the particular and the universal. No, we can define. Um, going to quote myself here, as the constitution of a particularity as universal. So, the battle for the MS of the Marxist discourse is a battle of political hegemony. Because we are fighting for determining which subjects can be political subjects. That is to say, I fight uh, or I struggle or I enter into this battle for the MS that is going to interfere, but the result is saying who is the political subject. That is to say, it depends on the MS that is intervening, you're going to have one subject or another. Nevertheless, I think that if we are aiming at intersectional feminism, the imposition of an MS and its subsequent hegemony imply a contradiction. So, there is one article that is, uh, I think it hasn't been translated in, into English, I'm pretty sure that not. It's Mujeres, Escotos Políticos de la Izquierda Lacaniana, which is Women, Political Subjects. In the Lacanian left, uh, Maria Liliana Tagliano, she points out that if we want a feminism that is symptomatic of politics, that is to say, if we see feminism as a symptom, it's because we see that feminism is making visible a conflict within, within um, society. This is also one of the points that you made in the book of uh, Psychoanalysis and Revolution. So, okay. If feminism is going to be the symptom of a contradiction with the society, we need to keep feminism a symptom. So she says, um, a feminism that is symptomatic of politics is a feminism that does not claim to be a universal, does not claim to be universal, but is willing to accommodate all diversity and dissent in terms of sex, gender, and decisions. And then, quote. So I believe that to be a symptom of the political to make visible and conflict, feminism should not engage into the battle for hegemony, but should engage into a different in the start. So this is where I'm going to put two examples, because I think this is a, too abstract now, too theoretical. So I wanted to put two examples of legislations in Spain. So as I said, the first one is going to be the trans law. So, um, how do you say other feminism? <laughs> Gender self-determination, so that was the main point of the new trans law. To situate ourselves, in Spain, you have different comunidades, communities, like regions, okay? And each region had the possibility to create their own trans law, okay? So, for example, I live in Catalonia, we had an LG, uh, a trans law, it's LGBTQI plus law, but it didn't work statewide. Okay, you only worked in Catalonia and then some other regions also, <coughs> but not statewide. So, uh, in the Spanish government, we have two different parties that are in coalition. So, you have Podemos and then you have the Socialist Party. Podemos is the party that came out of uh, Los Indignados in Freme, the movement of uh, 2011, already. Yeah. Um, so, you have two different positions. Okay, Podemos said, you want us in government, you want to govern, okay, then we have to have a trans, uh, trans uh, law. But we in the Socialist Party, there was uh, one woman who was like one of the leaders of the party, Carmen Calvo, who she did not advocate, um, she, she was not pro 
gender self-determination. Okay. There were these uh, dissensus, okay, and they, there was this huge fight within government that it was just like extrapolated to media and society, etc., etc., etc. So what I argue is that on the socialist part, they wanted to impose an MS that defined feminine as cis, cisgender feminism, they say, right? So obviously, if you are defining that MS from a cisgender approach, the subject that appears is the cisgender woman, right? On the other hand, Podemos was trying to impose a different MS in which that MS did embrace trans people, okay? <coughs> so at the end, this was, I'm telling you, a thing, you know, it was, it was an episode in Spanish politics, like the whole thing, at the end, uh, the Carmen Calvo, this woman who was like speaking against the law, she got kicked out of the sign of the, of the government, and there was a huge division in the um, in people who voted this, this political party, everything and that really bad, but at the end, Podemos got the law, and the law was passed, like, I don't know, like a month ago or something like that, but Okay, we say, oh, good, an AMS that is inclusive because it's, it has in, included in this case trans community. But there's a really big problem here, and this is what I, I think that we shouldn't get into a hegemony, or it is difficult to get into a hegemony from an intersectional approach. Why? Because non binary people are not within the group, non binary people are not represented in the group. And People who don't have a regular administrative uh, situation are not included in this law. So unless you are a citizen of Spain, and we know what citizens, like how citizenship works, and like, again, all that, and if non-binary people are not included in this, in this law, we again have the rest, no? So if we go back to the master's discourse, we have S1 intervenes in S2, you have the subject, but you have the rest, no? And the rest, in this case, we can say that it's the people who are being excluded. So again, from an intersectional approach, we can say this law is not enough. So that's one example. Second example. Uh, some years ago, there was this group, uh, trigger warning, I'm going to be speaking about sexual violence. Um, there was a huge case of sexual violence in Spain, and this made uh, the Spanish feminist movement to take the streets, like in a way that was never seen in Spain. So, um, the Minister of uh, Equality in Spain, Mr. Simons, um, Equality, decided to create a new law for sexual violence, okay? Because the way it was qualified in, in Spain was just like a mess. Nothing was great, everything was abused, and nothing was aggressive. So, they decided to change the, the law, okay? All of a sudden, we have the law, it seems like everything is good, and they included one article against sex workers. All of a sudden, this is not about sex workers' rights. This is not about abolition. This is about ending sex violence. So, uh, this was something that Podemos and the Socialist Party were okay, okay, we, we agree on this, blah, blah, blah. But some of the countries from the left, um, some of the parties from the left said, no, we are not going to vote for this legislation if you are including a debate that we haven't had. If we are not, if we haven't spoken to sex workers, if we haven't been speaking or discussing about sex work, we cannot include this article. So again, here, I think that we are seeing the problem with the German. So the law was that, I mean, the article said the, the, uh, the following thing. The main topic or the main element for someone to decide, if, for a judge to decide if there was a sexual aggression or not, is consent. It's not violence, it's not intimidation, it's consent. This is really difficult to define, and there's a lot of uh, discussion going on in Spain still, but they said, if you're a sex worker, you cannot consent. So, you're taking away the right to consent from sex workers without having a discussion about this before. So again, we have the same thing. Oh, we're going to create an MS, in this case, related to who can 
consent, a concurrent consent, and you decide to leave out of the picture sex workers. Again. So again, we see how a particularity, a particular reading of women of feminism is being imposed as a universal. And therefore, we again have certain subjects that are not being embraced by the legislation. Does it make sense? Now you see one more. See? No? Yes? Yeah. So, um, and now I have to say something else uh, to make this clear. So I'm speaking about the symbolic, I'm speaking about IMS, I'm speaking about the pros and the risks of hegemony, because we're always leaving someone out. So I wanted to speak about the topic of identity or post-identity politics, okay? But first, I want to make sure that we're in the same framework when we're speaking about post-identity. Post-identity approach is not anti-identity approach. It's really different. So, when I refer to anti-identity approach, I'm speaking about alt-right, no extreme right. This is not about negating differences. It's trying to approach a new framework, in this case, post-identitarian, to be able to refer to uh, intersectionality from a different approach. Yes? It doesn't make sense. Difference between anti identity and post identity. Because uh, I don't know where I have this. Because I try to be uh, really explicit about the difference because I didn't want to. Um. So, as I said, several voices have been, have been raised concerning the utility and future of the paradigm of identity politics. Some of these voices belong to the alt right or the neocons, fighting against the claims and successes, successes of the feminist movement, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, or the LGBTQI movement. I'm not in this side. I'm not speaking about anti, anti or what you say, identity politics. There are other voices that are being raised um, from the side of post identity politics. So, do you know what post identity is about? Because I'm going to pick the book. Okay, so um, several voices within feminism are pointing out uh, the flaws of uh, and weaknesses, let's say, of identity politics. So one of the um, uh, I don't have it here. Well, I'm going to put like two examples of uh, post-identity politics, okay? So, uh, identity politics are supposed to come with first wave feminism, okay? And like try to say, uh, well, we have a, a different identity. We have the, uh, the identity of woman. But that identity was, for example, racist. There's this one paper by Maria Valverde, which is called When the Mother of the Race is Free, right? So, this paper, what it says is that a lot of white women in uh, North America tried to engage into politics by saying that they were the mother of the rest, they, literally, right? Um, then this idea of identity became obviously problematic. And then we have other Lord, or we have Sigur, 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 so, identity politics were, uh, sorry, identity politics appeared to say, okay, women, woman, as we know, is not the only identity, but we have black women as identity, we have trans women as identity, we have a lot of different identities. Okay, what's the problem? That a lot of people are, are for example, if, and I try to go to the Spanish example, we are trying to be intersectional with the term of identity, but we see that it has flaws, and we see that it has risks, and we see that still people are getting out of the picture, right? So the term of post-identity, what tries to do, and this is where um, psychoanalysis comes, it's not about negating identity, but it's about, let's try to look at identity from a different perspective, okay? So I'm going to introduce the arguments of two uh, authors, and then I'm going to try to make my point clear because I think it's not clear for you guys. So, um, uh, one of the claims from post identity feminisms is that, uh, and I quote, the preoccupation with gender identity has enmeshed, enmeshed, 
feminism in a parochial politics of recognition whose primitive aims constrain its political imagination and prevent it, prevent it, prevent it from engaging in two broader democratic debates. And I close uh, quote. This is what we see in the Spanish uh, case. We will speak about certain laws at the end. There's like this axis of identity that is stronger than the other ones. And at the end, people who are not uh, Spanish citizens don't get we don't, don't get embraced by the legislation, or people who are non-binary don't get. I mean, people who are non-binary don't get inside the, the legislation. So this is one of one of those examples in which it seems that is, you know, uh, kind of element. Then um, McNay argues that some post-identity arguments leave certain questions uh, related to political agency unanswered. That is to say, it seems that, um, well, she explains that uh, certain post-identity notions are unable to answer certain uh, questions regarding political agency because the critique of identity does not engage into, let's say, somehow subjectivity. In other words, because I think I'm, I'm, I'm making a mess right now, can we think about subjectivity, can we think about agency without thinking about identity in the same way that we are thinking? Okay. Um, well, this was already present in, in Butler. Butler thought about identity not in a fixed way, no? He said that we should speak about identity from a more of a fluid way, um, and that, um, of, of course, we need like a core of the subject, but this core of the subject does not need to be with an identity, okay? I know that this, what I'm saying, can be like, uh, I mean, I can get an out of context with my words, I get in trouble, but the thing is that what am I proposing in, instead of identity politics? What am I speaking when I'm speaking of post-identity politics? I'm speaking of identification in politics. That is to say, um, Yeah, so I'm posing certain questions. Can we approach hegemony from a different perspective? Can we speak about hegemony without speaking about identity? Can hegemony be something other than the imposition of a particular of, of a particularity as a universal? Are there alternatives to the paradoxes of having an identity, having a subjectivity, having agency? Can we think about these three terms in different ways? And how can we think of uh, uh, an alternative to natural identity. So here comes the, um, the idea of, no, of processes of identification from psychoanalysis. So if you look close to psychoanalysis, you know that uh, identity does not exist. What we have are several processes of identification in which we engage. We don't have a complete and harmonious identity. We don't have a closed identity. That's why we engage into processes of, processes of identification. If we already had an identity, we wouldn't be identifying with different things, no? So, Janis Stavrakakis, in his book, um, um, La Pena de Política, he says, it's kind of a mistake, or it's a trick to speak of identities, no? We're speaking about processes of identification, and we can identify with certain objects, right? But I argue that we don't have all objects as available, right? I mean, you, you read the classics and you don't have a lot of uh, identities that you can identify with, no? So, um, I believe that one of, the, um, one of the things that we should do is uh, to think of identity processes in a different way. So I'm going to put one of the examples or one of the critiques that Judith Butler faces when speaking of identity as a concept that is fluid. Susan Heckman, criticizes Judith Butler because Hetman says that Judith Butler says, oh yeah, let's speak about identifications, but Butler still thinks that we need a core identity or like a core subjectivity. And Hetman says, oh, this is a paradox. Is this a paradox? I don't think so. I mean, we can speak about processes of identification and we can speak about the ego as existing. The I, the ego, exists. And that can be kind of like the self-conscious uh, uh, self-conscious self 
of the subject, but that does not need to be the core of the subject. Does it make sense? Um, also, um, another thing that Heckman says is that um, she goes to Winnicott, no, she goes to object relational theory and she says, yeah, we shouldn't be speaking about identity, we should, speak, we should be speaking about identification, but people can identify with certain objects and we need people to identify with certain objects. Here there's a problem, right? Because uh, that identification with the object is not complete either. Okay? So, another thing that is problematic in Heckman is that she... Um, she thinks that, I mean, not every identity is uh, liberatory for, I, I think I'm being honest, you're not following me, right? Are you? Yeah. Because <laughs> yes, I've been uh, missing some things. Anyway, Heckman also says that, for example, not every identification process needs to be liberatory. And I'm going to uh, speak here of, uh, of Wendy Brown in a state of injury, no? So, um, Wendy Brown says that sometimes we identify with the same, um, I'm say, the same uh, system that is making you injured, no? that is causing you pain, that is causing you sadness. So, in the case of the legislation in Spain, or in any legislation that has to do with uh, sexual violence, for example, they tell you how the victim has to behave. No? This is also in Eugene Ida's Planters, in King Kong Philippe, when she speaks about, um, oh, after you suffer sexual violence, you have to behave in a certain way, because a victim has to behave in a certain way. So, for example, in Spain, this, uh, this case that I told you that was like kind of uh, the starting point for the new legislation. Uh, so, this woman, she was sexually uh, assaulted by five guys. And then the defense, the authorities, sent a private, uh, private investigator. Yeah. They sent three private investigators to follow the girl. And then they did um, a report and they said, this woman goes out at night still, so we do, we do not believe that this is a victim. Yes. Victim don't go out there. Or, and these were, these were things that were set in court, right? So, we have also like a paradigm that is telling us how a victim has to behave. So also, the way in which we relate to those, um, to those things that injure us are something that we have to keep in mind. Another thing is that um, the problem would be how are we going to think of, uh, of the subject as well? Huh? So what I proposed, and I think I'm going to make this up my last point because I, I want to discuss some things and I also made some points that maybe are going to be good for the discussion. What I'm arguing is to think of intersectionality from a different perspective. So um, I argue that we have three different approaches towards intersectionality, okay? One of them, uh, within feminism. One of the approaches is lack of intersectionality, all right? So in non-intersectional feminism, gender is the only axis of oppression. If we go to the idea of hegemony, the MS that is proposed to intervene in the battery of signifiers is woman as a white cisgender woman. The symbolic that results, the symbolic, you know, that results from the, from the master's discourse, um, has the same power mechanisms as the patriarchal symbolic. It works the same way. It has the same mechanisms of power. It implies the same, uh, the same balance, say, somehow, and the same exclusion. Then we also have intersectionality that is based only on oppression. What does this mean? There are multiple axes of oppression, but the only one, the, the one that is considered as the primary source of inequality is still gender. Okay? The evidence that intervenes here is feminine. But the core of what is feminine is still related. Um, no, the symbolic allows for a wider spectrum of the idea of women. We saw, for example, with the trans uh, law in, in Spain. Okay, it is embracing more subjects, but still we are excluding some subjects because this is the the, the problem with the gender. 
Uh, so again, this is a still inscribed in a demonic and identitarian logic. And then we have situated intersectionality. So what I consider as situated intersectionality is this approach considers not only oppressions, but more importantly, privileges, which I think that is kind of uh, at least in Spain and some zone um, in some countries in the Mediterranean have the problem that we think a lot, a lot about oppression, but we don't think that much about privileges. No, when we're speaking about intersectionality. And also when we're listening to people from institutional feminism, they never say anything about being white. No, or at least in Spain, you don't have like a public discourse from politicians saying, well, I'm a woman, I have this problem, but they don't say, well, but I'm white and I have this uh, privilege. The inclusion or inclusion of privileges allows for a more complex understanding of intersectionality that depends on the context. So that is to say, um, so for Donna Haraway, we would say that it's situated because it's embodied, but it's also within a given context. So, for example, uh, I worked in an office in um, in a council that I was working. We had like an office that is called um, Service of Integral uh, Health. No, it's um, Service of Integral no, Integral Attention to Diversity on Gender and Sexual Matters. Okay. So we work, I work a lot with uh, trans kids, trans disabled, so in fact they are trans, but I also work with people who have been um, sexually harassed, but I also work with under eight boys that have been the abusers, okay? So um, we had like a lot of different situations, we had a lot of different contexts, and I, we also work with refugees. So I said, okay, in a lot of moments in my work, I am someone who is being oppressed by certain axes of oppression, right, within the context. But sometimes I'm the opposite. That is to say, yes, I am more prone to suffer sexual violence while I'm walking down the street at night than a cis white, white uh, um, cisgender male, but I'm also in the other side, when I'm facing, for example, a gay Moroccan refugee at, at work, no? so I was just like, this is, how, how's my identity then? My identity is not stable, not in, even in my work. I mean, I have different situations in which I have to identify in different ways, no? So that's why the identification thing came to me, right? I should be able to see what are the, uh, the axes of oppression, but also the privileges that are crossing, my, crossing me in every moment. So that's why I started speaking about situated intersectionality. So, on my view, situated intersectionality does not aim at hegemony, because it does not aim at creating a fixed, stable identity, but what it does is giving you some hints in order to see how you identify in different, in, in different uh, moments or processes or contexts of your of, of your life. So, what I said. Um, um, one thing that I proposed was this intersectional uh, situated approach, right, towards identity. So it's not about. I think that this is one problem of how do we think about subjectivity without identity? Can we think about agency without identity? Can we think about identity from a different perspective? Can we think, because I think that also uh, the word identity has been, I don't know, like overused maybe, right? So also what do we know as identity? Because when I think about identity, I don't think about the same thing as identification. I think that identification has at the end like more of a fluid contest it has more of the, of the things that are happening to me in my day to day, right? And um, so I have this notion uh, from Lacan and psychoanalysis, which is called the sexual position. So the sexual position are two different positions that the subject can have facing the symbolic, right? So it's not about uh, the hegemony of the symbolic. It's not about who controls the symbolic 
but also how we face the symbolic. So I think that um, I don't want to take more time. <laughs> we need to know that well, if identification with masculinity or femininity of femininity in Lacan depends on the subject's relation to the symbolic, that is to say, the European symbolic is not only patriarchal, it's androcentric. This is something that Brennan didn't, didn't say. It's not only patriarchal, it's also androcentric. So it's not only one notion of identity that is going to make us be powerful or not powerful. powerful. There are a lot of different uh, dimensions that are going to somehow uh, decide the, the, the space we occupy in this, in this structure. So what I said, uh, well, if the European symbolic involves a specific systems of oppression such as racism, classism, cisgenderism, sexism, ageism, and egoism, the sexual position of the subject, that is to say, you may have the sexual position of masculinity, and you may not relate as, I mean, you may not identify as a male. But the way in which this axis, uh, or this symbolic is working, is giving you the process of identification as a masculine sexual position. Also, you may not identify, uh, identify as that. So, um, from a situated theory of intersectionality uh, that assesses both oppression and privilege, a urban other class sees a a white woman possesses a masculine sexual position when she physically or verbally assaults or denies a livable life to a black and gay refugee who, who occupies the female sexual position within the European symbol. In this sense, the gender assigned sex does not define vulnerability or life as still as livable, but the sexual position someone possesses concerning a symbolic order. The sexual position depends on how subjects identify, fit or adjust to the symbolic in different contexts. So, I really don't have the answer. I mean, I'm still working on this paper, but I wanted to kind of um, open certain topics that we can discuss. How do we feel about identification processes instead of identity? Can we think about subjectivity and agency out of identity? Do, should, should we aim at hegemony or not? Because I am aware that a lot of people want to aim at, at, uh, at hegemony, you know? I don't really believe in institutional feminism because I'm an anarchist, so this thing that has to do with hegemony obviously creates a conflict within me. So I didn't want, I mean, uh, as Lagan would say, I can never say the truth, I'm not gonna say the truth, this is not the truth, this were just like some ideas that I want to throw to you. Oh, I okay. throw, so, I guess another word and stuff. So let me think what you think, I'll let you know what you think, and we can discuss some of these ideas. Uh, yeah, just firstly, just th thanks so much for that, for that talk. It was really great. It's has been down lots of notes. Well, I, I, do you understand me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm probably in the whole I, I just, uh, so in the UK context, um, the uh, debate on the sort of gender recognition, changes to the gender recognition law in the UK um, has often re re revolved around this uh, like the language of self-identification. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to be that this, uh, what seems to have provoked a lot of anxiety among people is uh, this uh, idea of, uh, on the one hand, um, people identifying, people making a public statement of this is how I identify, and you know, you have to um, uh, refer to me in different ways now, um, and the, the sort of this question of do you have the authority to identify yourself, um, and the the anxiety about the possibility of um, uh, intentionally, um, like with, with bad intentions, falsely identifying yourself in a particular way in the eyes of the law mm -hmm. in order to perpetrate violence, or you know, it's, it that's that's been the a kind of like one of the points of anxiety. Um, but my understanding from psychoanalysis is that identification is not a process or what, when we are identifying, it's not something that's like a, a conscious or voluntaristic process. So there's a sort of like slippage of meaning where the term self-identification is being used, but what they mean by identification is very different from what um, psycho psycho psychoanalysis means when it, when it talks about identification. So I wondered if that was something you encountered 
um, in the um, Spanish context of this term, uh, that like with this like slippage around the term identification this, uh, and some of the anxieties that it seems to open up that uh, people can claim to be something, but how you know what's what's the truth there? The actual discussion, like the public discussion, did not speak up at all about self identification, and I think that was good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, First of all, because, uh, what's, what, I mean, what, what does it mean, self-identification? Like, every identification should be self-made, or is it not? Uh, what are we speaking about? I think that self-determination was better. But, uh, yeah, it didn't really go around that term. They, I mean, I, I didn't even think about your, I mean, this didn't view my mind. Because, yeah. yeah, really, we didn't uh, speak about this at all. Um, but one thing that was coming to my mind while you were speaking is that where does identification go to? I think this is like a major point. So when we're thinking about processes of identification from a Lacanian perspective, it's not going to an event. This is important. That is to say, we are not speaking about, there, there's no, and this is, uh, for example, Lacan's critique to Winnicott's uh, um, object um, relational theory has to do with the fact that this object relational theory seems like, okay, you're going to identify with an object, and this identifying identification is going to be fantastic, and you're going to go to this harmonious identity or like status of the subject, which does not exist for psychoanalysis. So this is good. I mean, it seems like when you are, it's like the same as transitioning, no? It seems like when, when they were speaking about the the fact of transition in gender, it seemed like they were speaking about there's, there's a, una meta, like a finish line, you know? Like, <laughs> oh, what? Like, I'm transitioning and I can just like be here today, tomorrow, the other side. There's no an end point to this, or like a finish or like a goal that I have to accomplish to say, oh, I've been a perfectly uh, transition, no? And I have the same feeling with identification. It seems like uh, the speaking of processes of identification does not engage into the idea that you are going to have like a perfect identity that is not going to be conflict, conflicted, which is another thing that we are avoiding in this class. And I didn't want to get into this question, but if we look at designs, at the notion of designs, and we look at designs from identification, we may identify with someone who is hurting us because we get designs from that. So. At least this, this has to do with a lot of uh, feminist uh, readings on the notion of the victim paradigm, or again going back to um, Wendy Brown, states of injury. How many, or I don't know, like uh, Jessica Benjamin, when she's speaking on the bonds of love, no? Love and domination. Um, I think that, yeah, we're speaking about identification, expecting that someone to reach an identity. And this is the problem, right? But, we're not going to like a moment. Maybe Dave's first and then you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was so interesting and I'm really fascinated by a lot of the kind of ways of thinking through the the kind of issues surrounding how we like how to find our own identity. Um, so um, kind of still forming this question and I want to try and make it as clear as possible, so I'm gonna do it. Preamble, which is um, when you're talking at the beginning about how I think it's interesting you're talking also in the context of the law, right? And how there is always like those that are excluded from what I call like the set, right? So you might have a kind of idea of like trans people existing in that, but then like non binary is outside of that. But I think. Um, in the Lacanian like positions of situation, there is always that which cannot be included into the set, right? And we can see that happening in this very clear way in, in, in the law, where there is always that which is surplus, and that surplus actually gives value to what is made sense of, right? Um, so Jijek talks about the plus in LGBT plus as like can one be the plus, can one be the surplus that gives meaning to the set that is sensible, right, or like we really make sense of. So when you're talking about this and this idea of the, the feminine 
past the signifier. I do wonder if the feminine in so to kind of be clear in the Lacan's graph of situation, woman is written with the line through it because woman cannot be said to exist because she is it signifies upon the phallic phallocentric like symbolic law. I wonder if the feminine master signifier is the line that complicates the meaning of the signifier in the same way that the plus kind of functions as this excess to the how we like render up identity extensible in, in society. Um, and I wonder if uh, I kind of want to posit that all, identi all identity, as we kind of understand it with categorization in the social realm, is the masculine position, right? If, and I think that kind of Joan Kotchick's critique of Butler sort of makes this move where she argues that Butler's Joan Kotchick in her book, um, the last chapter of her. Uh, Read my desire for these uh, sex and the euthanasia of reason. She reads Butler as uh, locating gender in the symbolic and imaginary, but then Kopchek asks us to kind of think about sex as the real. And I wonder if, in a way, this, this is a way to think about fem the feminine masculine signifier. It's that that kind of usurps all meaning, but it's the difference of difference. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, going to well, actually, I didn't. I, I actually speak about that in the book when I uh, analyze the way in which the master's discourse works. So, I add. I, I don't know. I'm going to. Hold on. I don't know. So, uh, you don't understand. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I include this in my master's discourse. So this is the negation of S plus uh, S1, okay? So if you look at, if you look at the master discourse, you will have this movement, right? And then you have here and here. But what I argue is that there is something always that is not written as symbolic. And this should be the signifier that we should gain. Which is the negation of S1. Not the rest, not anything that is written as symbolic, but something that is in the middle. So I agree with that. I didn't want to get into that question, but yeah, we will discuss about it later. Uh, I also think that the most interesting thing we look at the perception of sexual sexualization, and sexualization is not like a word. Sounds kind of not. It's a little But I think that it's good. Cool to think of a not todo, not all, not all. I think that's like where everything starts when it comes to evolutionary. And then also, I don't know, I like intervening things, so I I think this is where we should aim at. But I mean, I'm not going, I don't know, like, part of the battle here. And also I wanted to say something that I think is important. When we're speaking about the subjects that are being excluded, they have been subjected to this. And this is pretty important. For, for example, I'm again going back to the law. Uh, people who are killed in the Mediterranean because of the European uh, frontiers, they are excluded from the law, but they are subjected to the law. And this is very important. The fact that you're not part of the symbolic, the, the fact that you're being excluded from the symbolic, does not mean you're not subjected to the symbolic. And again, Excluding, excluding non-binary people does not mean they are excluded. They are subjected from the worst, I mean, in the worst way. If you are subjected as a person, you are still subject of the law, but you're not the subject of the right of the law. That makes difference. Yeah. When you mention the sexual war law, uh, well, Sorry, the sexual violence law. And then you mentioned the example about sexual warfare, for example, which uh, I can understand when you're discussing the, your identification with the topic and then your sort of other engagement. But it sounds to me that the argument that was made to take out the 
the right spot of the position. It was an identity one. And what does that mean? It was the, the identity sex work group about it was about uh, the rights of these two to keep sex work. So I would like to understand how that plays. So yeah, are both in, in place at the same time? So there is the identity sex work that was used to. I'm going to ask problem. before you do the other question. The thing is that the article said that a sex worker cannot consent. That's it. So, anyone who is a sex worker, it doesn't matter what time of the day they ask you, you, you don't have the chance to consent. So, what you're saying that it's not a subject of, of a right. So, she's being excluded in grounds of her identity as a sex worker. But the, the answer it was also of a so, so the answer was, you want, if you want the votes, this was the political party, if you want the votes, get them, get them out of the question, because we didn't discuss about it, it was not about identity. Okay. Uh, the second question, when you question about the different law, and the self-determination law, or self-identification law, uh, it's, it's interesting that when you try to so speak about self-identification, self it will your mind, and not the other way around. And I wonder what the, whether S1 and S2, they also have a language hierarchy where words in English, they work as, as, S, uh, as SM or as S1 uh, and they colonize the other languages. So we, we use words in self-determination or the equivalent, we use in Spanish self-determination, but we use in English self-identification. So then S self-identification covers all the others and not the other way around. And I've been studying uh, white papers about the gender recognition law and reform, and they don't usually don't discuss the laws that are uh, enacted in countries that don't speak English. They don't translate those rights. So self identification is just a general term, of course, of the language. I think it has to do with the fact that when you are asking someone for the gender, they don't say, I identify as, we say, I am. So I think this is the whole thing. I mean, I don't identify, I am. Mm -hmm. When we were speaking about gender, mm -hmm. I mean, I actually think that it's disrespectful to say to someone, she identifies as her. What did, what did, what did she is? Mm -hmm. Her, that's it. So I think that because this in like uh, normal conversations is not used, I think that it wasn't used as, but I'm not, I'm not a tourist or a student who studies languages in Spain, so. But if, I just, I don't know, I find it disrespectful to say, she identifies us. What identify? Well, she is. And she is her today. And if she transitions to another, she may be ready. You know, so I think that there's like more fluidity maybe with the other Um, she's her. Thank you, many thank you. And you speak at last. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, right, yeah, sorry. Uh, you know why I have to go there, yeah, yeah, sorry. Well, oh, this person. No, you. Yeah. <laughs> then, well, there you go. I'm even. Yeah. Well, well, so, well, so, I apologize for coming late, so, so I might really be misunderstanding things, but I sort of think in, in, in that sort of black and white way, when I think about where psychoanalysis goes um, politically, but I'm sort of, or vice versa, you know, but I'm sort of thinking about what I'm, what I'm interested in and um, psychoanalytic thinking in, in a, you know, actually, as in having therapy, being a therapist, being a patient, training, etc., is the, you know, that there's something genuinely radical, a bit like, you know, you, you read a book and somebody else reads the book and they get a different meaning, etc., etc. And, and I've recently, I don't have the privilege is the right word, but I've had an experience of having had one therapist and having to, for practical reasons and otherwise, move to another one. And I become a different, I feel like I am being thought about differently. And that's a bit of a non state really. We, have, we feel differently, we're different people, etc. But I, I do wonder about, on a political sense, you almost have to, I don't know whether identity is the right word, but for, uh, this phrase, English phrase, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, you know. And sometimes politically, even though we need to be challenged, etc., etc. There's a sense in which, in you know, a sort of more political realm, whether we're putting theory into practice and back again, it's not a good idea to waver too much, you know. And um, so I suppose I'm, I'm sort of just thinking about the idea of um, 
I, examples I really believe in, I'm not dismissing them, but people being genuinely mistreated in English institutions like the Tavis Star, not thought about properly because of these identities, which do exist, but then in another relative way, how it can be very perhaps helpful in some ways in therapy to be mistreated or to feel mistreated or to feel something's painful. Or a bit like a relationship one might have where um, it's apparent to you and everyone else, it's not very healthy, but you, as you were saying before, you really identify that that person can really see something about you that nobody else can. And I'm, I, I just, it's a bit of a known question, but I don't really know how much that's helpful or not. Okay, sorry, can we take all the questions because we have 10 minutes? Well, I was just going to say, you're, you're, you're speaking about what are the consequences of the gate someone's identity. Well, so, so I just think about defences, maybe, you know. Defence? Well, it's our identity to see a, a defence against yeah. something, you know, I'm this, you're that. You know, you're you, I'm that, and something creative might come out of that. But very often in a political sense, it becomes something we have to do uh, Okay. When is it helpful? When is it abusive, a conflict, or necessarily not helpful? When is it helpful for there to be another? That's what I'm saying. All right. Oh, yeah. So, um, you're talking about it problems in that drawing up money-wise, in some sense of like, for example, most people generally in this set industry, it's about money, isn't it? It's about financial um, independence to some sense. But in, the, in this country, right now, we're living in a constant living crisis. More people are coming to poverty, higher crime rate, higher <laughs> like people are, don't know where to get money from. So, except for trying to fix something like more rights, wouldn't it be better trying to fix the actual underlying issue of like to make people actually financially stable, financially stable when they can actually pay for something except for like for example if people had more money in their pocket, like there'd be less crime, there'd be less people trying to run for money and like for example like uh, you feel more happy, wouldn't they, as well? It's like, more money in your pocket is better for your individual self as well. It's like, but that sort of issue, we should crack down on that, it's like, except for, like, right now, I think uh, that's 8 million children in poverty. <laughs> it's like, in the UK, we've got to live like the, like the middle class has disappeared, small businesses have disappeared, big corporations, making money and um, that's the sort of world we're going to go into. Okay, sorry. Oh my god, I'm not going to remember anything. <laughs> right, I'm laughing. Yeah. I, I am, but I don't even understand the way of right. So. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is just on the subject itself. So like, is the question or the problem that you're dealing with one of identity and then how does that work for the psychological for the individual and then how does policy or politics then address the psychological identity okay it's funny because i didn't show the powerpoint but it was like the last slide was this one that's pretty much it no i think that there's like this Tangled thing which has to do with, yeah, identity and subjectivity would be like kind of like the point that has um, relates to psychology that you were mentioning, and then agency as that political space. The thing is that I don't, uh, I usually when I engage into questions of identity, nobody makes the differences between agency, subjectivity, and identity. So I'm like, what? No? The same thing when we speak about desire. We speak about desire, but we're not speaking about pleasure, displeasure, or your sons. Or fantasy. No. Do you desire your fantasy? Do, no? What's your sons? Do you desire things that are not pleasant, uh, pleasant, or what you say? So I think that there's like this mixture of uh, identity, agency, and subjectivity that needs to be kind of like a, a further discussed in order to 
you know, like go forward and start thinking about political agency, political um, action from a different approach than the one that we're using uh, for identity. Not because identity politics are bad, I repeat, because they are not enough, which is different. And this is the main difference between anti identity and post identity. Okay? Awesome. Uh, second, <coughs> material conditions. Uh, this is something that blows my mind because we speak about this a lot when we speak about psychoanalysis, but then you go to certain places where they speak about Marx and nobody speaks anymore about false consciousness. So I wish material conditions would actually condition the identity of someone, but this is not real. Because if material conditions condition the way in which we identify, would we have uh, uh, governments against public uh, services? That doesn't make sense. Nobody. I mean, uh, the other day in the Monarch Sun came out with this, uh, this uh, what is it called, like report on the law of the strongest, we say in Spanish, I don't know how you say this thing, no? I don't even know support it, this, the law of the richest. Okay? And they said how the difference in inequality is actually like being uh, wider and wider and wider since the pandemia. But this is not changing the government. I mean, people do not identify based on their material positions. So this is something that is really bad, it's up, but that's, that's how it is. So, I also think that um, it is also naive to think that our material conditions or our oppressions are going to shape our identities when sometimes they don't. It's okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, for example, you are a working class person, but you are buying Primark. How is your process of identification? Are you identifying more with someone uh, from Instagram that has those, those clothes? Or you are identifying more with uh, a, a worker that is in Bangladesh. You know, this is also you know, like naive to think that if we fix or we change the material conditions, no matter what, we are going to have another identity. You know, because uh, I swear to God, uh, if we look at economic social status of people in the Mediterranean, for example, I mean, you know. Well, the King family maybe showed that, you know, the Ignalos, the movement that we had in Greece and Spain and then Portugal and Italy, you know? They have like a, maybe like a different uh, way of, of, of being, but I don't think that uh, changing the material conditions we are going to change the identification. Because I repeat, crypto boys, crypto boys, this is, this, is, this is a phenomenon, right? I mean, you have kids, uh, who are 18, 19, or they just got out of the university working for really big companies, they don't have uh, lunch breaks and they're like eating a sandwich uh, at, the, at the base of a, like, a really big building and they think they are the Wall Street uh, world. <laughs> are they identified as? Sorry, we have two minutes. Do you want to And then I, I didn't really get a question, but I guess that. Uh, I don't know if you're speaking about otherness. Um, otherness, mm -hmm. identity. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I don't really agree with the idea of, of identity. I mean, it's not that I agree, but it's also something that is problematic because identity means that we are looking from a, a privileged position. But uh, I don't know, like, I, I really don't know anything about clinics, so I don't know what I'm not saying. I'm not clinics, I don't <laughs> I'll stay with my theory work and feel like I'm going to analyze it. So, if there are no any more questions, I, I'm sorry because I, I don't know if I have to, have to confess. But I hope you have fun and that you like something. Thank you very much. I am so oh, yeah. Sorry, before you go, 11th of February, so this Saturday, there is um, a demonstration from um, Women Life Freedom and the Red Roots Collective. So it is on um, um, 1 p.m. Yes, it's 1 p.m. in Oxford. Is it in Oxford or Piccadilly? No, it's no. All Saints. All Saints. Oh, yes. 
So, like, we have some players here, so please, like, grab some and we'd love to see you there. Player, do you want to say something more? No, we hope you join us, it would be great, because we are showing up solidarity to live an Iran, who are resisting Iran, and it would be great if we see all of you there. I don't really know the Canyon theory or anything, so I can't put it quite in those terms, but I guess, yeah, so it all sounds, I think, really good and plausible, the idea that this is problematic about constructing any kind of, um, kind of identity that's always going to be excluding of someone. I guess the, the radical opposite position is refusing to construct any identity, so I feel like that in itself cause, can cause problems and issues. So insofar as um, kind of complicating things to say, there are some shared material realities that people face. And they're going to be edge cases and people on the outside of it. And just being kind of uh, insisting that everybody defines themselves in a certain way is going to be problematic. But refusal to define yourself at all strikes me. So there was like um, so kind of thinking of two different cases. One is like when I was growing up living down in Cornwall. Joe Cornwall is like a small little county at the bottom of... Um, I'm not really good at... In South West of England, but it, yeah. it's a bit like... Well, people think they're a bit like the Welsh insofar as, uh, to you know, like Wales, like having a regional separate identity, All right. like, like Catalonian. Um, okay. but, um, but, Cornish, but Cornish identities kind of died out a long time ago, but there's like a re revisionist movement that wants to kind of bring it back. I remember the census when I was growing up as a kind of mixed rep, like growing up as one of the few non-white people around. But the Cornish Nationalist Party putting out things for the census saying, it doesn't matter if you're like, if, you, if you're like black or it doesn't matter if you move down from London or whatever, put your identity down as Cornish, because they were desperate to generate enough kind of momentum. And you might think, well, this is just literally, this is that, and this is the attempt to construct an identity in a way that's kind of that and kind of would be better off just losing that identity. But then another case that I was thinking of is um, uh, the kind of political blackness movement. It seems to have completely done the example, but that was very strong in Manchester. The idea when you describe someone as black, that would include people of like um, uh, African kind of mixed descent, but also Asian people. And there was a big thing about them saying, we are black, the black community isn't just and now there's been a huge kickback against that because people are like, no, I don't want to say black, I'm this kind of, I want to add lots of things, add a specific thing. You can say, oh, we've got the intersection of different identities, no one can claim to be black because there's, there's no commonality that we can find that uh, uniquely identifies everyone. Therefore, let's abandon that. But I think it was a very good political movement to have a political blackness idea. Yes, it didn't capture everybody's experiences, and my experience is like mixed race Cornish person is actually <laughs> like radically different in a city um, uh, kind of Ghanaian uh, first generation person. But it did allow a political subject to emerge. So you, you're just saying people must refuse to say that we can have identities that simple. I worry that, that that stops us being able to develop. So, if you think about like classical Marxism, the idea of being the working class, yep. and they say, oh no, actually, let's just think of the working class because I'm A, B, C, D, E, F. Well, much of identity is perhaps like in an opposition to the other, isn't it? I just, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think your example speaks more about identification than about identity. Because obviously, I mean, political parties and the market knows you don't have an identity, that's why they give you an object to identify with. This is why me, as a nationalist, I can give you a new identity, because I know you don't have a closed identity. And like, if I give you a new object that you can identify with, it's because I know you don't have a closed identity. You know what I mean? I mean, this is not about... One thing that I think that is really problematic is the fact that you don't have a closed identity doesn't mean that I cannot, identify, that I cannot define myself which is different, a different pers perspective. To say that identity does not exist as such means that there's no a close, fixed identity. But that doesn't mean that you cannot identify with such emotion, you know? I mean, this is... And also, uh, to, be, to have agency has nothing to do with having a closed identity, you know? 
I, I, I see what, what you mean, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we see that a lot of movements that, being, that have been caused by identity politics have done a lot of things for us. Right? And we also know what's the comeback. Because Asian Americans did the same thing in the United States. They said, I don't want to be targeted only as Asian, because I'm not, you know, like, I'm not this part of a, of a continent that white people can say, oh, you're Asian and you're political correct. No, because they know that you're from, you know, like, I want to be identified as my country or as the, this region, and this is also a problem, right? But that, I, I don't think this is a problem for, for, for political engagement. I mean, um, well, yeah, as I said, uh, the problem is, do you have to identify with something to fight for something? Do, do I need to be, I am not a sex worker, and I advocate for sex worker rights, and I've been doing this for years. And it doesn't matter, I, I'm, I'm going to put the example of the sex, of sex work because of the, of the problem of reason. I do not believe that sex work is the best job you can have. I have my reserves with sex work. Does this matter when we are fighting for fundamental and labor rights? So I think that this is also a problem. Do I need to identify with certain things in order to fight for them, in order to live and engage, politically engage with, with this? The first thing that we, this is not about, I didn't see it as a word. I didn't see that one exists, so I'm just going to like, stay as a, pace, a passive agent that is not going to do anything. This is not about this. It's about being aware that you can identify with different things. And that marketing works like that. So you see like the, the commercial of Axe, I don't know, Axe in Spanish, okay? So, you know, you have like this heterosexual male who wears accent, like all the women approach him, like, you know? And then you go to your house, you put the thing, and you're, I don't know, bisexual, you know? And you're not having like that much success when you go out. But they are giving you an object that you can identify with. And this happens in politics again. It's, it's, it's not about refusing identity and then just like not acting together. It's about being aware that you can identify with different things. And again, what, what are the things that are going to make you... I identify with sex workers not because I'm a sex worker. I identify with them? No, I think so. Do I have a process of, of identification with my friends who are sex workers? Probably, yes. But that's my identity. Uh, is that conditions in equipment for me to engage into political action. This is something that we also need, because then we go to this median scheme of friends and enemies. Only from the week, I go against them, and this is a problem again. No, so I think that I, I, I see where you go, and I, I mean, that's why I'm not anti-identity, and I'm post-identity. Because I'm not negating, I'm not, um, throwing to the ground everything that we've done from identity politics. I'm saying that we need to move, move forward because what we've learned is that we've let people. I don't know, you, you know Paul Preciado, the philosopher? Yeah. So Paul Preciado, he just published this book, Dystoria Mundi, which I really recommend. And at the end of the book, he has this uh, letter that is letter for the new activists, and he's uh, Asking for forgiveness. Why? Because he says, we have been fighting for the wrong things. We were fighting for equal merit. We were fighting for blah, blah, blah. And we didn't understand that we had to fight for uh, gender relations. So it's not about saying, I didn't. No, that's not it. It is like, okay, we've learned, we've gotten a lot of improvement, we've gotten a lot of things, but now we need to move forward. Because we are seeing how identity is kind of problematic, and maybe we can think of something else. So that's why I also want to like make this, uh, this shift from identity to post identity, not anti identity. That's it. That does it make sense? Just because I am aware of time. Like, so we have so proud in one. Yeah, I would, my question is very short. Uh, you you talk about post-identity politics and it's 
post-identity yeah. politics, and it seems that it's going to be a kind of a new uh, approach to identity politics, as I as I see. So my question is that uh, w what kind of subjects this approach would create, and uh, will will other subjects would be excluded in this post-identity politics? So, for example. I can I can imagine that I'm a, I'm a cisgender male person, but but I, I can imagine that I I have the rights uh, to break this identity and become a become a for example a gay person. But do I have the rights to to break my identity of being a worker? Also, I don't want to work anymore as a wage laborer. I don't want to go to, you know, for shifts eight hours a day. Do I have the rights to do it? Is there any any place for me in the legislative apparatus also, or am I am I allowed to be any? Uh, am I allowed to have any kind of identities while I go to work every day, eight o'clock to four p.m. And uh, I, I mean. How can you how can you include me that I I I hate to work as a wage laborer? Uh, okay, I I I've gotten some notes, but maybe I'm missing some of the of the questions because I think yes, you can be something that you can be you you can stop being a worker because you're not being your own boss. That's what they're telling you. No, keep the boys. No, this is like a whole thing stay. You got alpha males, keep the boys, like uh, we have like this brand that's called Mr. Wonderful. So he makes uh, one plus cups and they say, be your own boss. <laughs> like say to Claudio Jefe, yes, neoliberalism is telling you that you're not one. Neoliberalism is saying that you're an entrepreneur of yourself. Actually, uh, uh, Erdem, Erdem, the. Um, um, you know, Eric Ehrenberg, the way of being... Uh, okay, there is one book about uh, how these... Um, the word. Uh, yes, they are telling you that you, you can have another identity. They are telling you the whole time that you can have another identity. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people that are being exploited don't think that they're being exploited. Because they don't identify. I think don't identify with the working class. Is their identity being working class if they do not behave as such? That's another thing. But what's, what's the identity? The, it is based on action or not? If we're not going to identify someone based on action, we could also say that everyone who makes a gender heterosexual male is a rapist. Because we're not speaking about action, we're speaking about identity. You know what? This is also kind of like mm, weird thing, no? Uh, of course, when we're speaking about identities, we're also speaking about material conditions. This is clear, no? And this is something that needs to be in the picture. Actually, the way, and I would say, the objects that you can identify with are primarily subjected to your material conditions. When we're speaking, for example, about, about neoliberal uh, identification with objects, no? with uh, uh, products. What subject will that be? with this tricky way of thinking about subject. Jorge Alemán, he's an author of the Lacanian Left, he introduces the, the idea of the subject of the bad news. Yes, the unconscious subject, the subject of psychoanalysis is not a hard subject that is going to give you harmony and you're going to be like free of conflict and you're going to be just like in harmony and peace with everyone. Yeah, this is a conflictive subject. Because you're going to have to think about the way in which you identify. It's really easy you not know, thinking about the way in which you identify and just thinking about do you have an identity. If there's someone that is going to be um, excluded or not, well, if we focus on the way, if we think of post identity politics from the situated intersectionality approach that I propose, I don't think that someone should, um, should get out. But again, this is a still. Uh, can I just say something? Because we have had to speak for people who want to ask. If you 